Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Head Start to A-Level Chemistry, where I help you to bridge that gap between GCSE and A-Level. And in this video, we're going to be looking at atomic structure. And I'm going to make sure that you've had a good refresher of all the vital content that you need to bring forward from GCSE level, but I'm also going to give you a few things to look out for when A-Levels begin. All atoms are made up of three types of subatomic particles protons, neutrons and electrons and they're called subatomic particles because they are smaller than atoms and that's what the prefix sub means. Two of these particles, neutrons and protons, are found in the centre of the atom which is called the nucleus. The nucleus's existence was discovered by Ernest Rutherford and he found that that is where the majority of the mass of the atom can be found. He also determined that it had a positive charge and later we discovered that that positive charge was because of the existence of the protons in the nucleus, but Rutherford didn't know that at this point. And the nucleus compared to the whole of the atom is absolutely tiny. It's just a small fraction of the whole radius of the atom, and yet that's where most of the mass is. The neutrons were only discovered later by James Chadwick, and they are found to be uncharged, but they do contribute to the mass of the nucleus. The electrons orbit that nucleus in shells, but we can call them energy levels. That's a slightly more technical term. The electrons are much, much smaller and they have much less mass than the neutrons and the protons. Now, these electrons will vary in number depending on what the atom is. So the space and the volume that these electrons occupy will also vary depending on how big or small the atom is and how many of these particles they have. You need to know a bit more about the protons and the neutrons and the electrons than just where they are. We need to know very specifically what their mass is and their charge is. Now, we don't actually measure the actual mass of a proton and a neutron because it'd be so, so small, so many decimal points, we couldn't get our heads around it. So what we do is we compare protons and neutrons and electrons to each other. And so we use what's called the relative mass of a proton. And a proton and a neutron have got the same mass, and so we give them a relative mass as one. And so if we had a proton and a neutron on the smallest seesaw you can imagine, a proton would balance a neutron perfectly. Whereas an electron is much, much lighter. We can consider it to be tiny and almost zero, but actually it's one over 1840th of a mass of a proton, but very, very, very tiny. I've already mentioned the charge of a proton is plus one, which is why the nucleus is positive, even though we've got neutrons in it, because neutrons don't have any charge. The electrons, though, cancel out the charge of the protons, and that is a minus one charge for these electrons orbiting the nucleus. Atoms overall don't have any charge because they've got the same number of positive protons as negative electrons. And if they were to lose or gain electrons, they would become charged and we would refer to them as ions to differentiate between when the protons and neutrons are equal and when they have changed. Hopefully you'll remember that we keep track of the numbers of these subatomic particles using something called the atomic number and something called the mass number. Now the atomic number for ease is sometimes referred to as just simply the symbol Z. And the atomic number is also on the periodic table at GCSE level referred to as the proton number. And that's simply because the atomic number is the number of protons an atom has got. And so you can see that for this example, lithium has got an atomic number of three, which means it will have three protons and fluorine nine, nine protons. And as we've just said, they will also have three electrons for lithium and nine electrons for fluorine. And that's the significance of the atomic number. The mass number is given the symbol A. Now that represents the total number of protons and neutrons added together in the nucleus. So lithium is seven. So there are seven subatomic particles in the nucleus for lithium. And fluorine is 19. There are 19 subatomic particles for fluorine. But we know that for lithium, three of those particles are protons, which means that the remainder must be the neutrons. And so we simply do seven subtract three, which means that lithium has got four neutrons. And we do 19 subtract nine for fluorine, which means it's got 10 neutrons. 
Hopefully you remember that it is the atomic number that gives an atom its identity because of that number of protons. All the atoms of lithium will have three protons. All of the atoms of fluorine will have nine protons. Sometimes you can get atoms that are very, very similar, but they have subtle differences. And these atoms are referred to as isotopes. So if we use the most common example first for chlorine, it has got an atomic number of 17. And there is another isotope of chlorine, which also has the atomic number of 17, which means that both of them have got 17 protons. And that's one of the characteristics of isotopes. They have got the same number of protons. But you can see from their mass number, 35 and 37, that they've got a different number of neutrons. The one on the left has got 18 neutrons and the one on the right has got 20. We sometimes refer to isotopes by their mass number, so we might call this one on the left chlorine 35 and the one on the right chlorine 37. So they've got the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. And since the number of protons in an atom is equal to the number of electrons, these isotopes will have the same chemical properties because it's electrons that give an atom their chemical properties. So that means that all isotopes will behave in the same way. At GCSE level, the existence of isotopes and the examples of isotopes are very limited, mostly just chlorine, maybe copper you might have learnt about as well. But actually at A-level we zoom in a bit more on this picture and we see that actually far more elements have got stable isotopes than we realised at GCSE level. And as a result of that what you'll notice about the periodic table that you get at A-level is that all of the relative atomic mass values are given to one decimal point. And so that means it is incredibly common for an atom to not have a whole number for their relative atomic mass value, which proves the existence of more than one stable isotope for that element. Hopefully you'll remember that you need to be able to calculate the relative atomic mass for a particular element. And that's why we have the decimal point 35.5 for chlorine at GCSE level. And if I use that as an example, if we refer back to the chlorine 35 and 37, clearly some atoms of chlorine have a mass of 35 and some are 37. The idea of relative atomic mass means that if we were to get, say, 100 atoms of chlorine and sit them on a really, really sensitive balance, what we would then be able to do is take an average for those 100 atoms of chlorine. And when we do that, we find that the average mass of chlorine is 35.5. And that is because 75% of the atoms of chlorine have a mass of 35 and 25 have a mass of 37. And so the maths that you need to be able to do for this situation is the average mass of an element is found by multiplying the abundance of each of the isotopes by their mass and dividing by the total. So for the example that I just said, 75 was the abundance of chlorine 35. We multiply that by 35. We then add it to 25 because that was the abundance of chlorine 37 multiplied by its mass 37. And then we divide that by the total abundance, which was 100 because I was working in percentages. Abundances don't have to be percentages. It could be a fraction. I could have said three quarters of chlorine is chlorine 35 and one quarter is chlorine 37. And so the calculation would have looked like this. And then instead of dividing by 100, I would have been dividing by four because that was the fraction that I was working with. You need to be able to do this for any elements, any data that you get presented with at A level. But the method is the same. The sum of all the abundances multiplied by the individual masses divided by the total. When you're studying A-level chemistry, we take the term relative atomic mass and start applying it to larger substances that have a formula. And that's where this distinction comes in between relative formula mass and relative molecular mass. The correct term that we should really be using is relative formula mass. We were allowed to use either of these at GCSE level, but the important clarity here is relative molecular mass only refers to things that are molecules, so simple molecules such as H2O, CO2, etc. 
However, only some things are molecules, whereas all substances have got a formula. So this encompasses things such as ionic compounds, NaCl, as well. Definitely not a molecule, certainly has a formula. Not only do you need to be able to work out the number of electrons that an atom has got, you also need to be able to explain how they are arranged. Now at GCSE level, you should hopefully remember that these electrons are arranged in shells or energy levels, and each energy level has a particular capacity. And so the first energy level can have two electrons and then it is full. When you're placing electrons into energy levels, you always fill the innermost levels first. And so if an atom has got 13 electrons, you put two electrons into the first shell, then it's full. You put eight electrons into the second energy level, and then that's full as well. The third energy level needs these last three electrons. That takes us to 13. The capacity of the third energy level is eight as well. And then any spillover, what we learned at GCSE level, is that any spillover goes into the fourth energy level. And that will only at GCSE level have ever needed to contain two electrons. And so the electron arrangement was something like 283, written as a simple sentence for my example here, which is an aluminium atom. But it might have been 2,4, 2, 2, 8,8,2 2, or something. That's the electron arrangement or electron configuration at GCSE level. Other rules about electrons which are important to carry over from GCSE level is how it links to the periodic table. You will hopefully remember that the columns of the periodic table are called groups and all of the elements in a particular group will have the same number of electrons in their outer energy level and it is the same as the group number. And so all of the elements in group one have got one electron in their outer shell or energy level and all the elements in group seven have got seven electrons in their outer shell or energy level. Similarly, there is a rule about the rows of the periodic table, which are called periods. All of the elements in period one of the periodic table have one occupied energy level, and period two has two occupied energy levels, and so on, as we work our way down the rows of the periodic table. These are two really useful skills to have at your quick disposal when you're dealing with exam situations. By far the biggest difference you'll encounter between A-level chemistry and GCSE chemistry is what happens when we zoom in on the model of atomic structure. And one of the first things that we'll notice is that electron arrangements are different at A-level. And that's because the energy levels contain electrons that are not all equivalent the energy levels are actually split into what's called sublevels or subshells. So for instance, if we consider the, just the second electron shell of the periodic table, the eight electrons that are in that shell, they aren't all equivalent. Two of them will be the equivalent to each other, but six of them will be quite different. And so we need a new language to refer to these electrons with. And so we call them the S subshell for those first two electrons, and then P subshell for the next six. And the capacity that we learnt for each of these energy levels at GCSE is derived from the fact that there is more than one subshell in a particular energy level. So for instance, the first energy level only has an S subshell, which is why it can only hold two electrons, whereas the second energy level has got an S subshell and a P subshell, which is why when you add two and six together, we get the capacity of the second energy level of eight. As we work further down the periodic table, more subshells come into play. There's a D subshell, and that has got a capacity of 10. And that's where the transition elements come in, because they are so large, they have more than eight electrons in their outer energy level. Now, the rules are really quite similar to GCSE in that you fill the one subshell before you move on to the next subshell. But this extra idea of all the electrons in the second energy level not being the same is quite different. So for instance, at A level, an electron configuration or an electron arrangement might look something like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And this big number tells us what energy level the particular electrons are in. And then the S tells us the subshell, 
And then this number that's like written in the superscript, a power position, tells us how many electrons are in that subshell. So this is the second energy level, the P subshell, and there are six electrons occupying it. All of the same rules that you learned before still apply. So we've got two electrons, two electrons, and six electrons. So that's a total of 10 electrons. So we know we're talking about neon because neon's got an atomic number of 10. But it's just that we are zooming in and we are getting a clearer picture that those eight electrons from GCSE level that would just have been written 2, 8, they aren't the same anymore. And so we need to have this additional language to show that they are different. This new language of subshells enables us to have some new words to describe the different areas of the periodic table. For instance, on the left hand side where you've got group one and group two, these two groups have got their outer electrons in an S subshell. And so we refer to these two groups collectively as the S block of the periodic table. And then this right hand side of the periodic table where the outer electron is in a P subshell is referred to as the P block. And in the same way, we've got the D block in the middle, which is where you will recognize the transition metals as being found. And then last of all, this bit that's sometimes left off the periodic table is the F block of the periodic table, which you don't even need to know very much about that at A level. But it's nice to know that this area has its own set of language and terminology, the F block of the periodic table. Okay, I hope you found this Head Start video useful. If you want to find out more about A-level chemistry for this topic, check out some of the links in the description. If you found it a bit tricky and want to go over this topic a little bit more slowly and in more detail, I'll put links to my GCSE explanation videos in the description as well. But that's all for now. I'll see you again soon.